Oops. <laughs> we'll stand up, Sarah. I guess not. <laughs> to those Christians in the New Testament that, uh, that we're supposed to be like. Uh, and these are the five words, ergon, we've already looked at, um, which is just where we get our word energy, ergon. Uh, it's the working, duty-doing term. Uh, it's the most common word for, for doing good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. These are the works, uh, not because in order to get saved, but after we are saved, we just love the Lord and we love others and we we want to do good. They, they sort of flow out of us. And so uh, these are the works. And uh, Titus 3.8 is a very important verse there. And it says that those who have believed, it's important that they maintain good works. Um, so you believe first and then you keep doing the good works. Anyways, then the second word is the word kopos. Uh, and that is a word which is oftentimes translated by the word labor. Uh, and it has the idea of a weary and toiling. Uh, laborious type work. Uh, not just work, but the kind that's monotonous, <coughs> repetitious, and 
It just exhausts you. That's the kind of word. And, uh, again, we're told we're supposed to be doing that. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. This isn't salvation, but when we get to heaven, we are going to stand before Christ. What they call the, the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. It's an elevated platform. There was one there. and uh, Well, Rome had one, but Corinth had one there. And, and so when Paul wrote to the people there, he talked about the judgment seat of Christ. They, they knew what the Bema seat was. Uh, and it's where the, uh, the, the runners were awarded, their awards. And, and we're going to get awards. Not that we deserve them because it's all done just because we still love Christ. And uh, it's not that he owes us anything. But, but nonetheless, he's going to have special awards and accommodations for faithful service, uh, for our labors. Uh, we mentioned all that uh, ergon, phobos, any of these terms. Uh, agonizing, working, striving. None of these are meritorious. They don't earn our salvation. They've got nothing to do with our salvation. This is after we're saved. These are the things we do just because we love the Lord. So that's important to keep that distinction. The third word that we looked at last week was the word soon athleo. You have the word athlete there, uh, soon, and then athlete. Soon is the prefix, means together with. Athleo means to strive, to wrestle. And uh, so it's a. A, a, an athletic concept of the team pulling together. And I think this is really a beautiful picture of, of striving together. And that's what the local church ought to be. We ought to be athletes pulling together. And uh, Paul mentioned in Philippians there, uh, Yodia and Syntyche, two women, he says, who were, who were fellow workers who strove together with me. Paul says, these two ladies were on my team, and they were pulling with me. And, and now you know, we're on the same team. The church is so high, but, but, he, but he says, uh, we need to do that. Strive together, pull together. And that's probably a picture of the ants here uh, carrying this rock together. Uh, but that's, a, that's a really a good picture of what the church ought to be, working together as a team for Jesus Christ. And whether that uh, ministry is is within the body or caring for a sick member or uh, the gospel outreach ministries of the church or into the community or, or whatever the church is doing, we all pull together and work supporting the ministry of Jesus Christ. And so that's what the word soon athleo means, striving, working together. Here's a fourth word, um, agonizomai. And you probably hear the word, which we get our English word, agony, right there. Agonize, that's where this word comes from, or the English word comes from this Greek word, agonizomai, and it really does, it means to agonize. And sometimes it's translated by the word agonize or agony, in agony uh, in Scripture. Sometimes it's translated by the English word strive or fight, uh, compete or combat. And uh, that's, that's what the word it has. The meaning is conflict, uh, fierce competition, uh, combat. It's used of battles, fighting. So it's an agonizing term. Uh, this is a term which is used, again, it was, a, it was an athletic term in the, uh, when Paul wrote and used this term in Scripture. Uh, it was used of the uh, athletes in the Olympic Games and the wrestlers. Uh, the fierce competition. And it wasn't just uh, the, the early on in the match. The agony was, was really in the, in the end, in the third period maybe. I don't know if they had periods back then. But today we have three periods in a wrestling, a collegiate wrestling match. Uh, and it would be like in that third period when, when I got Will Bond on his back and I'm pinning him, okay? And that was eight or ten years ago. And, and, and he is exhausted, and he is uh, sore and tired and out of energy. He's got nothing left, and I'm about to pin him. And then in agony, he puts forth that last gut-wrenching effort, rich, pushing past the exhaustion barrier, the pain barrier, beyond what anyone thought he could do, and he throws me off and flips me onto my back. So that's all imaginary. <laughs> <laughs> Probably today he would. Anyways, that's the idea that agonize is that final gut wrenching move uh, when when you thought it was down. Uh, over in First Corinthians nine, you've probably got there by now. First Corinthians chapter nine. Uh, the word is also used of um, uh, 
a boxer of competing. We'll start in verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Paul says, though I am free from all men, I've made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. Nor that I might win those who are without law. And to the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may attain it. So he says to the Christians, he says, and he's liking himself in the gospel ministry. He says, this is what I do. I, I become everything to everybody so I can win people to Christ. And he says, you know, just like in a race, how everybody strives, a whole bunch of people running, but only one's going to get it. The fastest, the guy who tries the hardest, the winner. He says, that's how you ought to run. The Christian life. Run as hard as you can. As all of you, there's only you're the one that's going to win. Okay? Now, in the Christian life, we all will win. Okay? But he says, I want you to run as hard like you're the only one. As if you were only one person's going to get the reward. And he says, that's how you're going to run that hard. And then he says in another analogy, in verse 25, and everyone who competes for the prize, well, that word competes is the word agonize. Everyone who competes, who's involved in this fierce competition, agonizing for the prize. And he probably has in that usage, that analogy there, a wrestler or a boxer or a... a Pankterionist, <laughs> the, the MMA guys who did the, uh, it was back in the uh, Greek and Olympics, they had the uh, MMA type thing too, where they had the mixed uh, running, the boxing and wrestling. And, 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 and so, so he says, uh, those people also, whoever competes is tempered in all things. In other words, is self disciplined. He, he doesn't eat that, and he works hard doing this, and he does this. Why? So he can be a champion. They do it for the prize. They do it to obtain a perishable crown. They're just going to get a laurel wreath stuck on their head. We, Christians though, we are going to work that hard. We're going to be so disciplined. We're going to agonize like that. So we can receive a imperishable, an imperishable crown. Something, some rewards or something in eternity. And then Paul says, therefore I run thus. I'm not just out walking around. I'm running so hard that I can win the prize. I got my eye fixed on the ball. I'm running with certainty. And not only am I running, but he says I'm fighting. He uses, so he puts himself as the analogy here, like a fighter, like a runner. And he says, I'm a fighter and I'm fighting. That, that word there, fight, means a, a, a pugilist. Uh, I'm, I'm boxing, not as one who beats the air. I'm not just shadow boxing. He says, but I discipline my body. I bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should be, become disqualified. <laughs> he is a man with a passion, and he's willing to compete at the highest level. And he's liking it to these athletes in their agonizing, their discipline, the utmost conflict, the intense competition. And, and again, it's not just the boxers in the first couple rounds when they're sparring a little bit, feeling each other out. We're talking about like when Rocky gets down, knocked down onto the canvas, battered and bloodied and broken, and there's no hope. Uh-oh, is, is he gonna get up? Is he gonna make it? And he gets up and beats the tar out of the guy. Yeah, that's, that's summoning, that's the agonizing term that Paul uses here. And he says, that's it, Christians ought to be like that. The term used for the runner, long distance runner. He's run around in the 1500 meter. You got to run around that track, what, eight times? And on the seventh time, he's coming around the final curve and he realizes he's still three strides behind. And in agony. Now, you're already exhausted. That final kick, though, he has to summon every bit of energy. The agonizing, gut wrenching final kick if he's going to win. 
That's the term that Paul uses for the believer's activity, to agonize. But he also uses it, and it's translated fight. It's such a fierce competitive term of conflict and combat that it actually is translated with the word fight. Uh, Paul uses it in 1 Timothy when he writes. If you turn over to 1 Timothy, you'll notice some of these. 1 Timothy, chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, Paul tells us to fight the good fight of faith. The word agonize, agonizmize, there two times. He says, agonize the good agony. <laughs> yes, it's the command, Christians, we need to agonize the good agony. There is a good fight, there is a competition. <laughs> it's a battle. It's a battle against our old, lazy, sinful flesh. It's a battle against Satan. It's a battle against the ways of this world. It's a battle against false philosophies and false <coughs> ideas of this world. It's a battle against all the temptation. There's a lot of things we got to go battle against. And he says, you've got to agonize the good agony. Fight the good fight. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called. And confess the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight. Agonize. I wonder how much that we do in the Christian life would qualify under agony. We in America have it here pretty easy, don't we? We don't agonize a whole lot in the Christian life. Because we don't really suffer much visual, vis, uh, visual, literal persecution. And so we really, the Christian life is really pretty easy. We don't agonize too much. But we should. That's kind of effort we're supposed to put before you. I turn over to 2 Timothy. You see it again there in chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And Paul's testimony is this. This is his dying letter. These are probably the last few words that he, he wrote as an apostle in prison before he was executed. And he says in uh, verse 6, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. In verse 7, I have fought the good fight. In other words, he says, I have agonized the good agony. I've finished the race, and I've kept the faith. <coughs> I agonized the good agony. I did it. I suffered, I endured, I grueled, I gut-wrenched, I put forth every ounce of energy, I dug myself up off the, 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 the canvas time and again, I was beaten, I was stoned, I was shipwrecked, I, I was persecuted, I was chased from city to city, and I kept getting up, and I kept going on for Christ. I didn't give up the faith. And there were temptations from within to be lazy and, and, and to be untruthful and to be spiteful. And, and I rejected those. And I kept on and on. And whatever it was that caused me agony in the Christian life, I, I did it. Because Christian service, living the Christian life requires fighting. It requires supreme effort. As though it were the difference between life and death. Maybe it's a determination to complete a task spiritually or to obey a command. You know what? There's some commands in the Word of God and, and maybe on a Sunday I, you know, I, I cover some of these things and you, oh, that's too hard. I'm not going to do that. Now that's when we dig in and say, I don't care what agony is required. I am going to obey that command. I'm going to agonize and put forth every bit of effort until I obey it. Now again, this isn't to earn our salvation. This is because we're already saved and we love God uh, and we're going to agonize just like a husband would do anything. He would agonize to care for his wife. Like a mother would agonize and do anything possible to care for her kids because she loves them. Like a soldier would fight and agonize and do anything. Why? Because he loves his country and he loves the people who are behind him. So we do this, we agonize, not to earn salvation, but because we love God. And we want to please Him who's enlisted us to be His soldiers. But we agonize. Maybe it's to obey a command. Maybe to meet a goal. Maybe to conquer a sinful habit. You say, oh, that sinful habit, that's, ah, I've been doing that for so long, I'm going to just keep doing it. No. How about agonizing over it and getting over it and conquering it? 
How about fulfilling a mission or resisting a temptation or keeping going or confronting a brother or keep on believing or getting out of bed in the morning and having your devotions or tending with a body of believers? Keep on striving. You see, the Christian faith is oftentimes inconvenient and it's difficult to be obedient and faithful, diligent servant of God. It's not easy. It requires agonizing the good agony. This term, fight, fought the good fight, conjures up a military unit, doesn't it? And that's really what the church is. A bunch of soldiers all agonizing for the cause of Christ. And we do it individually in our own lives. We do it together for the cause of Christ. Are you willing to submit to military discipline? To accept modest rations as a Christian soldier? To give up some comforts? To take a cold shower? How much are you willing to agonize in your service for the Lord Jesus? Just because you love Him. <coughs> you willing to agonize to do right? Are you willing to agonize to suffer reproach for the cause of Christ? Are you willing to suffer a little bit, to agonize a little bit, to go on a missions trip? Are you willing to suffer a little bit, to agonize persecution, to agonize bearing others' burdens? Sometimes it's agony to love other Christians, isn't it? It's a command, isn't it, that you love one another as I have loved you. To love others sacrificially, that requires a little agonizing sometimes. It's not so easy. Some people agonize over just coming to church. <laughs> oh, you mean i got to get up earlier on Sunday to go to church? Or you mean i got to... Uh, Hurry home and get dressed and, and, and get out to church on Wednesday night. And, and it's like a little agony involved even to come to church. <laughs> Some people, it's agony to clean church. Agony. I know, I hurt last night when I was back. <laughs> Some people, it's agony to serve in the nursery. Put up with those kids for 45 minutes. Or an hour and 45 an hour. <laughs> I'm just agony to risk resist temptation. Boy, we just want to gossip. I just want to shout back. I just want to be angry. I want to lie. I want to exaggerate. I want to. There's, there's these temptations that we have, and, and and you know what? It's agony to bite our tongue and to hold back and to do what we should do. To resist certain temptation. To not look. To not lust. To not speak. <laughs> agony. Confront a brother in sin. Ooh, that's hard. <clears throat> Even harder to humble ourselves when we have sinned against a brother and go to them and confess <clears throat> or to forgive. It's agonizing sometimes to be reconciled. How about to publicly take a stand at work as a Christian? Stand for the truth and righteousness at work, and people may laugh at you at school. Maybe that's what Paul meant about agonizing the good agony. I don't know what agony is required in your life to live the Christian life out and to follow Christ and to serve Him, but, but that's what Paul says, fight the good fight. Agonize. Like a soldier, like a boxer, like a wrestler, like a runner, put forth the ultimate energy, effort. Uh, 2 Timothy, since we're right there, if you back up a chapter, chapter 2 and verse 4, we're just reminded there about the soldier, how disciplined he is. He says in verse 4, no one engaged in warfare. No one that is an active soldier, a soldier in active duty. Nobody that's soldiering engages himself with the affairs of this life. I said engage, but I'm in entangles. He doesn't get snared up and distracted by the affairs of this life. Why? Because he's got something more important to do. He's a soldier in the Lord's army. And he's battling against the powers of darkness. He's battling against the lust of the flesh. He's battling against the world. He's got a mission. He's in agony. And he's going to go forth. Why? That he may please him who has enlisted him as a soldier. 
I think the old King James has be accepted of him or acceptable. The idea is to do what is acceptable. In other words, pleasing to him. It's not earning salvation. It's just because we want to please our Savior so much. We love him. It's about pleasing our Lord. And being a good soldier. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians that don't understand what this word agonizing means. Fight the good fight. But frankly, they... And, and I don't know if they're really Christians or not. People who are unwilling to agonize at all. They say they love the Lord, but they're unwilling to agonize at all. I don't know. They don't feel too well. They're not available. They, too much else going on. They're too busy. And yet they make themselves available. And they find time for other things in life. And come Monday morning, they're all well and have time to go to work. But... But to serve the Lord, we, we, we don't have time for that. Something wrong with that picture, isn't it? Christians who've never experienced the blessing of sacrificial giving. Young Christians, people bursting with energy, and yet they're using all their energy for worldly things, but when it comes time to use some of their energy for the Lord, oh, I don't have time. All sorts of intelligence and creativity, it's employed in our creator, our, our recreation activities, it's, it, it, we employ it at work, all of our intelligence and creativity, and yet when it comes to the ministry of the Lord, we, we don't have any to spare. Hmm. So much communication going on, phones and texting and tweeting and social media, and yet so little genuine, edifying speech going on. <coughs> so much travel, so little missionary enterprise. So much to do for Christ, and oh, I don't have time to be involved. I can't do that. You know, I work, I work 50, 60 hours a week. Think about it. How many hours in a week? 168. Let's say you work 60 hours a week. Still gives you 108, right? Yeah, but I gotta sleep eight hours a day. That's another 56. That leaves you with what? 52 hours with nothing to do. You think you could give God a few hours of those? Just a couple hours of serving the Lord a week? How do we measure up? I got thinking of just the amateur. I know Paul in Scripture compares us and he says, I want you to be like the Olympic boxer, the Olympic wrestler, the runner, or a warrior competing for life and death. But let's not even compare it to how about the Christian, the average Christian in America? How does he compare even to an average jogger? An amateur jogger who gets out there and sweats and gets a side ache and fights through it and shin splints and he goes out again the next day and he's out there three days a week before he goes to work in the morning. For what? What's he doing that for? That guy's not even going to run in a real race. He's not even going to run in any race, probably, other than his own backyard with his grandkids. He'll never even get a participatory ribbon. And yet he does it, and he puts forth more agony than most Christians do, serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords for eternal rewards. You make the comparison. How do we measure up? Or do we measure up at all? You say, well, I don't want to be compared to a soldier, a runner, a boxer. I just like to keep it simple. I want to do what Jesus would do. If Jesus did it, that's what I want to do. Just keep it simple. Did Jesus toil? Did he ever agonize? Yeah. He sure did. Imagine the agony he went through for you and I. Everything about his life was always, I, I'm here to do the will of him that sent me. That's all that it, it all has mattered. Uh, this, I'm his beloved son whom he's well pleased. Why? Yeah, well, that's because I keep doing all. I'm here to do the Father's will. I'm here to do the will of him that sent me. To follow his commands, to speak his word. And there in the garden, it says, being in agony, he prayed more <coughs> than his Agony. Agony over the souls of men. Agony, emotionally, physically, the distress of facing the cross. So if you want to be like Jesus, 
agonize in prayer. That's interesting, speaking of which. Turn over to Romans chapter 15. Because agonizing in prayer. How many of you ever agonized in prayer? I mean, got down on your hands and knees around your face on the ground and cried in anguish to God. I know we say prayers, but do you really pray in agony? Well, you know, that's what Paul asked the Roman church to do. The church at Rome? He says this in verse 30. Um, let's just back up a little bit, though. Uh, in verse 27, it pleased them indeed, the, the, and, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of the spiritual things, their duty also is to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this, and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. Paul was bringing a gift uh, of money, um, and, and he was going to deliver that first, and, and that was going to be fruit to their account. Uh, but then he says, I'm going to stop by Rome on my way to Spain. That was Paul's desire. Um, but he says in verse 29, he says, I know that when I come to you, to the church at Rome, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren. As Paul is writing, he's in Corinth at the time he's writing this letter. He's writing to Rome and to the church there. And he says, I beg you, brethren. Pray. I beg you, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit. That's really interesting. And, and I think it has to do with Paul's love of the Spirit of God. His love for Christ, his love for the Spirit, their love for Christ, their love for the Spirit. Anyways, he's begging them in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Holy Spirit, to strive together with me in prayers. Agonizomai. Agonize with me. Agonize together with me in prayer. <coughs> for me. Paul's agonizing for himself and he's asking that the church join in with him in agony. Agonizing prayer. Why? Because Paul's going to have to go to Jerusalem. <coughs> Now, if you go back and read Acts, and we're going to get to this, Dennis has been doing a great job in the book of Acts, Sunday school. Maybe we'll get to this. It's in Acts chapter 20, I think. Remember when Paul was in Ephesus, he was on his way, and he says, but I go bound in chains to Jerusalem. Not in chains, but bound in the Holy Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that are going to befall me, but that the Spirit witnesses... <laughs> He says it's going to be chains and imprisonment. And then in verse 24, Paul says this, but none of those things move me. It don't bother me a bit. Neither do I count my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I'm going to Jerusalem no matter what it costs me. And you know what? The Romans prayed for him as Paul did too, even though bonds and imprisonment awaited him. And God delivered him from the Judeans. That's what he says in the next verse, verse 31, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. And, verse 32, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. God answered those prayers. Because the saints agonized together in prayer. I don't know. I don't know why we don't agonize in prayer. Is it because we don't think things are that important? Everything's okay as it is? We'll just say a few little prayers. We don't have to really wrestle. We don't really have to struggle or strive in our prayers. It's like we're contending about anything. That's the word. Agonize. In prayers together with me. All right, we just cover this last one quickly. Phileo to mapomai. You recognize the first part of that word, phileo, is the Greek word for love. Very important word. Very high, intense word. It's brotherly love. It's family love. It's the love of mother and father have for each other, children for each other. It's the love that God has for his son, the Lord Jesus. Phileo. Very strong love. And it's coupled with the word tomao. 
from which I get my name, Timotheus. Tamao plus Theos is to Timothy. Uh, Tamao means honor, and Theos is God. My name means honor of God, Timotheus. Well, this word, phileo, tamao, means to love honor. And it has the idea of to seek after honor, to be ambitious and zealous toward reaching a high level of honor. That's what the word means. And it's translated uh, to aim for, uh, ambition, uh, to strive for, uh, that, and those are words that are translated that. Second Corinthians, uh, we have this word used, Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9. And Paul, just in these previous verses to 9, he was talking about, uh, I'm willing to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, but if that's not what I want, then I'm going to be here present in the body and I'm going to serve. And, and he says, it doesn't make any difference to me whether I'm here or gone. My aim, notice what he says, therefore we make it our aim. That phrase there, make it our aim, that's the word to love. To love honor. We are pursuing high honor. Therefore, we pursue high honor. We make it our aim. We are ambitious, zealously working toward, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. Paul says, my life, that of the apostles that are working with me, uh, 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 Silas and Barnabas, whoever's with me, Timothy, uh, it is our aim to be pleasing to Him. We are striving for high honors in everything we do for Christ. It's not a love honor in the sense that I want to be thought of, oh, I want everyone to look up at me because I'm so important. No, Paul just wanted to aim. He wanted his life, his ministry, everything he did for Christ to be acceptable as though he were doing it for the commander-in-chief. Oh, he was. He was doing it for the king of kings. And he wanted his work, his service, his ministry to be the absolute best so that he would be decorated that's what it's worthy of. He didn't take his ministry as, eh, it doesn't matter if I do or don't. Uh, if, I, if I have a chance, I'll, I'll prepare for Sunday school. Uh, maybe if I get a chance Sunday, Saturday night or Sunday morning, I'll put some time in. Or, uh, oh, I, I know Sunday's important. I'm going to go to church Sunday morning, but it doesn't matter if I stay up half the night Saturday night and then I can sleep through the service on Sunday. Everything he did was his absolute utmost for his highest. Wanted to be honorable the Lord Jesus. Romans 15 again, um, verse 20. Mm -hmm. Well, let's back up again. Romans 15, verse uh, 18. For I, dare, uh, for, I not, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. It's not about me, it's about what Christ does through me. And then he says, In many signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Illyricum, uh, that's uh, up in uh, Yugoslavia, what is now Yugoslavia. Paul says, I preached from Jerusalem and all around that area, all the way up to Yugoslavia. Some 1,400 miles. And he says this, he says, uh, oops, verse 20, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Uh, I, I fully preach the gospel of Christ, and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel. Not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. In other words, Paul says, I, I primarily went uh, to, to towns and villages where Christ wasn't known. From Jerusalem to Yugoslavia, 1,400 miles, every town and village I could. And what was his goal? I, there's, it, 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 there it is again. I made it my aim to preach. Phileo to not lie, to preach. He sought the highest honors in his preaching ministry. He didn't take his preaching ministry. When he went to stand before people, maybe it was just a Lydia and a few people, women down at the riverside. Maybe it was in the synagogue with 100 or 200 people. Maybe it was on the, uh, Solomon's porch uh, 
in, in the temple, uh, to thousands of people, wherever it was, and whoever he was speaking to, he strove for highest honors. He recognized that he was an ambassador of the almighty God of the universe. He didn't take it lightly. He strove for highest honors. Committed to a noble task in a manner worthy of highest honors. That's how he took his Christian service. <clears throat> I would encourage you, whether you're teaching a three-year-old in Sunday school and only one kid shows up, or whether you someday have an opportunity to stand in front of a thousand people and preach the gospel, or whether you're witnessing to somebody in a nursing home, or you go tonight to be a blessing at the gardens, that you do so as, as the most important thing in this world. No, not in this world, in this universe. You're serving the King of Kings, and you're on a mission today, tonight, to that individual. That's why Paul considered his Christian service. Highest, most noble, <coughs> most worthy thing he could possibly do. I may be just a clay vessel, but I'm going to be the very best clay vessel I can be. I may not be Charles Spurgeon, but I'm going to be the best Tim Bantle pastor I can be and preacher. And I'm going to study all week so that I, when I come in the pulpit, I'm prepared and I'm accurate in what I teach as much as humanly possible. Because I realize who I'm accountable to. But it's not just for pastors or missionaries or the Apostle Paul. This is what we're all to be doing in the Christian lives, striving to serve our utmost for his highest. How do we measure up in our works, our wearying, laborious service, our striving together as a team, our agonizing, fighting, and our aspiring to highest honor as we serve Christ? All because we love him. He's not going to love us any more or less. Remember that? He loved us from eternity past. He loved us and sent his son for us. These works that we do, these aren't going to help him love us more. He loves us to the nth degree. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. It will be his child. But our love for him ought to be overflowing in this kind of service. Heavenly Father, we have to confess that we, uh, we really don't measure up too well. And uh, we need your strength, we need your enablement, we need the Holy Spirit to inspire us to greater <coughs> service. And, and maybe even today as we looked at these passages and people in their own hearts were being pricked by the Holy Spirit as to, <coughs> to the amount of service they do and their priorities in life and the amount of time they give you or the amount of effort they put forth or uh, the... Um, amount of energy they're willing to expend for you. Um, we just pray, Father, that they would not shrug that off or reject your spirit, but that they would resolve, that your spirit would enable them to uh, make true changes in their life, that they would repent and, and turn and, and uh, renew themselves to serve you with gladness and a love that overflows from their heart. We love you, Father, and everything we do for you is is simply out of a heart of gratitude and love. Thank you for saving us through Jesus. Thank you for counting us worthy to even put us in the ministry and to be able to use us. We know we're clay vessels. We know we're sinners like everybody else. And yet, Lord, you've by grace, you've, you've counted us worthy and put us in the ministry, and, and we can be used of you. And so help us, Father, to, to dedicate ourselves once again to serving the King of Kings. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in your hymn books, number 414 is the uh, song, Am I a Soldier of the Cross, Follower of the Lamb? Well, if you're a Christian, you are a soldier. You've been enlisted. So let's stand and sing. We'll just sing verses 1 and 4.
serve you, to agonize in our service for you, Lord. Give us the desire to, to struggle to serve you better, to serve you more. As the pastor mentioned, we are so easy here in America. And we, we see and we hear about people overseas that uh, their, their faith is restricted and, and ours is so easy and so open here. We pray, Lord, that you give us strength and give us the desire to, to uh, be more faithful to you in each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.